Uh, Roy, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> welcome to Comic-Con. Welcome to Sea of Thieves. Please welcome Joe, Mike, and Peter from the Sea of Thieves team. Give it up for the gentleman here. <laughs> A fantastic, how many hour flight? 14? 12. Uh, yeah. 12 hour, a fantastic 12 hour flight to join all of you pirates here today. So, whether you play on a PC, an Xbox, or whether you're just a scurvy dog at heart, I welcome you here. We're gonna have time for Q&A, but I'm gonna ask some questions for these gentlemen as well, and you will all have your opportunity too. So, without further ado, here we go. That's us, look at those handsome devils. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have hit that before, so we'll go to the next one. Um, gentlemen, we want to jump right in with sort of some philosophical questions. Can you guys hear me all right, or is it better if I'm here? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so if we could talk, what's the role of lore in Sea of Thieves? Where is the Sea of Thieves? What time period is it set in? Give us some of the, the backstory and the philosophy behind this world you've created. Cool, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so... I think philosophically, like to answer that at a really high level first, like we, the vision for Sea of Thieves has always been this really strong idea of players creating stories together. So by giving players this incredible amount of mechanical freedom and giving them these tools in a world, when players meet together in this shared world of Sea of Thieves, you get this explosion of possibilities and it can always play differently each time. So from a high level, when you think about that, mechanical freedom, and then the theme of pirates, kind of that romantic notion of pirates being about freedom, that you're in a world of role play, you're in a world where you can assume these different roles dynamically, and based on how you work with your crew, it's going to play out differently. The, I the idea of pirates is this perfect marriage for the core game design philosophy of this freedom that we give you. And then, when you think about, you know, just that tight crew bond, of four friends working together, they're heading towards the horizon, and they're going to go dig up treasure. Like, it's not, as we've said before, it's not dry historical pirates. This is, this is the pirates that you dreamt about when you were a kid. This is the pirates that you, you played in the playground. So, from a high level, just the wrapper of being in this pirate world gives you all the rules and the language that you need to understand what you need to do in this world, because everybody loves pirates. Well, most people love pirates. And... Making it about X marks a spot and being a merchant, being a bounty hunter, being in this world and having these awesome adventures. Just the theme of pirates is, is, is perfect for the core vision of the game. At the same time, though, we, we want to create a world that is this stunning backdrop to your adventures. And we knew right from the start that our players were the main characters of this world. They're the ones that have all these adventures. And we didn't want them to feel like they were playing second fiddle to a bunch of characters in the game. That being said, the richer we make that world, the more reasoning that we give you behind why are islands the way they are? Why is the world the way it is? How, why does it function the way it does? Um, I guess that's what we'll kind of get into on this panel and how we're exploring that, not only in the expanded universe, but also how we want to make that more of an important part of the game. But the emphasis is that by doing that, we'll enrich the player-to-player -player interactions in our world because we're giving them more tools to play with and more reasoning and more roles to play. Thank you very much. Joe, you want to jump on that or do you want me to push forward? Well, I think the thing we would... So, obviously, we've been chatting about Sea of Thieves all morning, right? Um, yeah. Like, and, <laughs> uh, like we, we, we were on a pirate ship a couple of hours ago taking some photos and having some fun. And, but what you were talking about in terms of your Willy Wonka analogy. For sure, me, we can jump into that right I, now. I, um, I genuinely think it's the most accurate wow, way anyone's uh, described our game to us. Yeah, that's um, very humbling. Um, um, <laughs> so, sorry, I'm going to just say as well what Freddie's about to say. Like, we've been building this game now for right from the initial inception. for It's probably four years all in. And we've, we've been to shows, you know, we, we've done some Comic Cons before. And we ourselves try to eloquently surmise what Sea of Thieves is. But just meeting Freddie for the first time today, he, he put it better than I've ever heard anyone put it. I was like, you're a fan of this game. Like, the way <laughs> no, he's no going to summarize though, it, right? <laughs> I genu God, no pressure, but I genuinely almost teared up when he described the game this way. Okay, so <laughs> I, look, I've played games as long as some of you old people have played games, all right? I'm 42 years old. I've played basically 39 years. 
Um, and I've always dreamed of a specific type of game, and I started playing it beta, not alpha. My friend, who's even more of a nerd than I am, said, you have to play this game, you'll love it more than me, come in. And we jumped in a beta session, and I was telling these gentlemen, the game, you said the word world so many times in your first sort of answer to this first question. That's what it is, even beyond a game. They're world builders, and I described it to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory which sounds crazy, but hear me out. They're Willy Wonka, they're Mr. Wonka. They've handed out these golden tickets to all of us and invited us to the chocolate factory. Now, there are traps. There is Slugworth, who wants the, the secret recipe for the everlasting gobstopper. That's Meg, okay? <laughs> If that, there's the fizzy lifting drink room where if you touch the walls and you drink the drink, you're going to corrupt the thing and they can't make the soda. These are all tests and elements that Wonka put in the world to see which kid was worthy to take over. So there's, there's me. I'm Charlie. I'm, I'm a nice pirate. I won't attack you unless you attack me first. There's, <laughs> there's Augustus, the glutton who wants everything. There's I want an Oompa Loompa now, only it's a blunderbuss <laughs> instead. There's Mike TV, who's the streamer on Mixer or Twitch or YouTube or whatever. Whatever it is, and we're all in this world, and these evil, cruel developers known as Wonka <laughs> put all these little tests, and you know they're sitting back watching us and observing and seeing how our morality plays out to see if we're worthy of getting the golden chocolate ship at the end of our pirate adventures. <laughs> but to me, that's what this game is, and as a longtime multi generational, multi decade game player, I've always wanted a world, and I think every right-brained gamer has always wanted a world where you're the protagonist, but it's not Shepard or Link or, or uh, anybody. It's you and the dialogue written or the words coming out of your mouth. And if you can't express how you feel and the pirate you're speaking to doesn't like what you're saying, that's a rap for you. That's a rap for your treasure. That's a rap for your rep. Because those moralities that you guys have now put in place, which is, hey, play as morally as you are comfortable playing. There are repercussions if the player you're playing against is better than you, but you have complete and total freedom. And I love being the writer of my own game. I love, like we were, I was telling you guys stories that you've heard a million times from a million other pirates, or this guy was trying to get me and I did this, or I finally got the last treasure and as I turned a corner, a galleon came and sunk everything and stole everything. And we went through those stories for an hour, but the game in itself to me, and I think to a lot of other people, is a world that we sort of get to be the person we always wanted to be, but if our mom was looking, maybe we wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, that's Willy Wonka. <laughs> so there is a, a Sea of Thieves novel that's coming out. Um, I know that fans love getting into backstories of things. I experienced this on Star Wars Rebels when all these people read a book that came out before the, the cartoon and they almost knew more about my character than me, so I had to read it quickly. So novels are always exciting when it comes to fandoms. What's it about? How closely tied to the game is it? And uh, we will continue these slides as we go. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's just, just quickly, I think. Um, with Sea of Thieves, we didn't want to just create a game, right? We wanted to create like, the, like this world, this universe, and bring it to people in loads of different ways. Uh, and for me as a, as a player and as a, like, like, yes, I'm a member of the dev team and that's cool, but I get as excited reading the novels or reading the comics or watching the trailers and, and learning about, about this world and this game and everything that we're building. So I, I've literally got the manuscript for that book in my bag right now. That I've, you should I'm, not have told everyone know, to hear right? that. Uh, <laughs> there is security guards here. Um, but <laughs> the, the I'm on about page 60 and I just got to a, um, a bit, which I won't spoil, but where it references a member of the community um, like as, as kind of a legend and almost like a tale within, within the book itself. And, and that's something that we've always been really keen to do in terms of building that into the world, player stories, the things that happen, the things that really um, matter to us. But it was a really cool, nice surprise for me to read this manuscript that you've been working on you've been working mm. on that Chris Alcock's been writing um, and to get to that and be like oh that's so cool like when that person reads that novel it's going to blow their minds right and and I can't wait to get through the rest of it so but I'll let, I'll let you guys kind of answer the question more about the book itself no I mean that that, that was a great opener I think when you think about um are we getting into the meat of it now which is the, like the law of Sea of Thieves that it's important for us to kind of define the past timeline mm -hmm. of why is the Sea of Thieves the way it is? But the crucial difference, I think, that you're describing there is that we're at a poor moment in time, we're at present day in the Sea of Thieves. The future, ultimately, is going to be shaped by our players. 
because we're running this live service game. And we'll bring threads back from the past with characters, but players' stories are going to be seamlessly merged with it. And Curse Sales, the trailer that we showed, and, and Forsaken Shores, that's coming in September. There's an idea that players, through playing the campaigns, they're almost impacting the lore. And it's not like this dynamic thing that's doing it on the fly. It's more just being um, acknowledging of players' actions and the roles they play in the world. But going back to the past of Sea of Thieves, and we're big fans of hiding things in plain sight. And it's a small thing, but the idea that the Sea of Thieves is a real place, um, and this is what the novel explores, which is, you take the game at face value, it's just a pirate sandbox. And that's fine to enjoy the game at that level, that's what it's designed to be. But if you really love the world and you want to dig a little bit deeper, there is the idea that the Sea of Thieves and the real world coexist. So the Sea of Thieves is accessed, essentially, um, through a magical portal. So when you start the game, even at launch on March 20th, you get a little map on the table in the tavern, pinned with a dagger. And we were really playful. We put um, Spanish place names around the Sea of Thieves. So there's a depiction of the Sea of Thieves and the Devil's Shroud, if you've played the game, is like this corrosive shroud that encases the Sea of Thieves. But the Sea of Thieves is, is actually somewhere in the Caribbean. So if you actually track down the place names that are also on the map, you'll actually be able to position exactly where it is on Google Maps. So the, the Sea of Thieves, like in terms of uh, locationally, is actually like north of the British Virgin Islands. And when you think about... You're not putting us in the Bermuda Triangle if anybody tries well, to visit it, are you? That, that, <laughs> that's, it's, that's, it's pretty close. <laughs> it's not a coincidence um, that that's there, right? Which is, you think about real pirates and the superstitions of seeing mermaids and the stories of krakens. It's just playing on that idea of maybe when people go missing, that's where they go. They go, they go to the Sea of Thieves. But what it does is it frames the player and the characters in Sea of Thieves as visitors to the world. Mm. If you only knew the coordinates, if you only knew the route, you'd be able to get there yourself. And that's what the novel kind of explores, mm. the idea of the first pirate legend uh, who's in the game, right? I mean, he's, he, no, well, spoilers, but he's waiting for you in the pirate hideout at the end. And in terms of the law, he was the first person to cross the shroud. So he worked out a route to get into the Sea of Thieves and the novel is called Athena's Fortune, which if you dig a little bit deeper in the game, that's kind of the main objective. Um, and we called it Athena's Fortune because it was the idea of to become a pirate legend, you need to find what sounds like a treasure. But Athena's Fortune is actually a ship and you see it in the cave at the end, at the end of the game, and it's kind of framed there like one-eyed Willie's ship in the Goonies, which is kind of uh, not, not much of a coincidence that we ended up with that. Um, but the book ex kind of shows you the ship and the adventures of, of, the, of the pirate lord in his prime. So that ship, that's a wreck that's got a tavern built on it in the game. It goes back in time, and you're seeing the pirate lord first crossing into the Sea of Thieves and the adventures of that ship in its prime, setting up the Sea of Thieves as it is today. So setting up the names of Ireland, setting up some of the characters that are referenced in the game in, in a really big way. Um, like the trading companies, the whole idea behind the trading companies was they're visitors to the Sea of Thieves, that you could be in the real world just past the golden age of real piracy and the same way a pirate would go, oh, I've heard a rumour of a, of, of a merchant fleet, you know, fully, fully laden with goods, you should go take it down. They're also talking about, we've heard of this place called the Sea of Thieves. And we're, we're tracking down this rumour to try and chart a course to go and find it. I mean, that's essentially the whole premise of this. And as players come to Sea of Thieves, so do the characters in it. So new trading companies might come, new visitors might come to the world, but a lot of that is explored in the book. It's, uh, it's, kind, of, it's kind of there to, for all the fans out there, it's to give you kind of a deeper sense of engagement with Sea of Thieves. So actually, actually seeing the journey that the, the pirate lord made there for the first time and discovering the Sea of Thieves for the first time kind of represents that, that pirate legends journey into the world. Whereas we have another co uh, character in the novel who kind of is more of a proxy for the new player as well. And you, you get to see these characters kind of experiencing the Sea of Thieves for the first time with, uh, uh, across, a, across a period of time. Um, for the first time, basically. So on one hand, you have the Pirate Lord. He actually goes to the Sea of Thieves. He's the one who kind of kind of like discovers the island, charts it, and makes a fortune. Um, and then there's this other character who, who's called Lilarina, and it's about her getting to the Sea of Thieves sometime after the Pirate Lord's been there. So she's kind of like a proxy for us as players when we first 
play the game, basically. So it's, it's, uh, it's really cool, and it's very exciting. And the story j jumps between those perspectives. It does, right? yeah. So it yeah. kind of and plays with time and, and everything else. Right? It does, so, yeah. And I'm not at the end yet, so that's as far as I'm 60, 60 pages it, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is exactly, I've learned that much. Yeah. It's exactly that point. The, pi the pirate lord who's in the game and explored in the book is, is a proxy for the player. Mm. Like, he's had all the adventures the player could possibly ever have in that world with that amount of freedom. He's had that incredible crew bond with his crew and he's had these incredible adventures and he's done everything. That's why now he's built a, a tavern on a ship and he's just going to drink and tell his stories for the yeah. rest of time. And anybody else who can prove themselves worthy can, ha can have a drink with him. That's essentially the, the concept. How many Pirate Legends do we have? I know. Hey, look at that. That, is, that is super cool. Congratulations. That's, yeah, that's, amazing. that's, that's right. a big yeah, investment of time. Right. Like, amazing. So, gentlemen... There's a lot of things in the world that reference the past in Sea of Thieves, like you had mentioned. Um, we have shipwrecks, which I actually found some that, I, that became the first DLC, and I even posted. I was like, hey, who's that guy on the ship? <laughs> um, so there's definitely that. There's ancient ruins. Uh, the further down into the ocean you're willing to swim, sort of the cooler stuff you can see. Uh, cave paintings. Do, do these have meanings, and will they be revealed to us over time? They do have meanings, and a lot of that stuff has been placed um, very thoughtfully, all, all about what we're talking about, which is building a world that, um, once you start to connect the dots, it all kind of ties together. Some of that we'll explore, is it, is it actually explored in, in the novel? Have you guys heard any fan theories on what these things mean? And if so, which one's your favorite fan theory? Fan fiction's always, like I come from the Star Wars world, there's a lot of it. So <laughs> fan fiction is always the best slash or the worst that you could ever get. So what's your favorite, best or worst? It doesn't matter. What's do you want to talk favorite? about Falkor, Mike? Uh, I, I have to talk about Falkor. Falkor. Fal Fal yeah. like, the thing luck Dragon? Are we talking about a luck Dragon? Did you say Falkor? Captain, Falkor, yeah. Oh, Captain, okay. Captain sorry, Falkor. I went, I went never in in story, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a creator on YouTube who put yeah. together this kind of, this video detailing this theory. And uh, it was one of the first we spotted that mm. had put these clues together, of the map to find where the Sea of Thieves was in the real mm. world. But... And he was kind of looking, exploring this video, really, really well put together video, exploring kind of connections to Francis Drake and piracy and connection to the Sea of Thieves. But the, theory, the theory was that, um, it, it is what, what I was talking to you about, the idea of that people that go missing in the Bermuda Triangle end up in the Sea of Thieves. And he was like, I, I bet there's going to be a time when we're going to be exploring Sea of Thieves, we're going to dive down to a shipwreck, and we're going to find some World War II bombers on the, on the, <laughs> on the bottom of the ocean, Ben. And I just, I just thought that was such a kind of... Uh, it's a great idea, we can't do it now. Um, but I just thought that was a really nice um, kind of use of like just connecting the dots and extrapolating it out. I just thought it was a really cool um, novel idea. Yeah, he, um, he, he kind of, he, he goes to different islands and he, uh, he looks at all like the, the symbolic paintings and stuff like that. And there's, there's certain kind of symbology there for like the passage of time, for, you know, the ancients themselves, for there's like stories that kind of pirates who've gone to these islands have kind of like carved into the walls, kind of leaving clues behind them after they've long gone and stuff. And uh, I mean, just like probably a lot of you have kind of gone, stood there and kind of, oh, I wonder what that's about. He yeah. actually kind of makes these videos and kind of really digs into it. So I really do uh, yeah. enjoy watching his, uh, his uh, YouTube videos. Really, some some really of this good. stuff gets um, discussed at length, doesn't it, on mm. Reddit? I think a lot of the clues are in the world. There's a lot of symbology around mermaids mm -hmm. and the relationship between mermaids and, and who were obviously in the Sea of Thieves before pirates got there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that idea of um, why do the mermaids help you in Sea of Thieves? On the surface, it's a really simple game mechanic. You fall <laughs> off your ship, a mermaid <laughs> saves you. But we've explored why is this affinity between humans mm -hmm. and mermaids? And that's the idea of an alliance and why the alliance exists. That that's quite at length in the book, isn't it? I mean, yeah, we go to quite yeah, a lot of detail it is, there. It is. Um, and I mean, if, if the I've thing not is... I've got that yet, so can you not spoil it? Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's all new to you as well, then. Um, yeah, so yeah, so like in the book, there, there is, it touches on it in a big way. Um, but, you know, even, even with the book itself, there, there's, there's still pieces in the world that kind of build on that story as well. So there's still stuff that's out there to be discovered. But, yeah, the, 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 the novel will provide a lot of framing yes. for... for um, that particular part of the uh, backstory of the Sea of Thieves. I, th I think the important thing to note as well is what we don't want to do is step on the player's own stories no. and make it seem like all the cool stuff happened in the past. Mm. And as a player, I've turned up too late. Mm. I mean, that's, that is like the primary reason why we call uh, the little bastions of civilization in the world outposts. That's where you go to 
purchase things and trading your treasure. And they're not ports because the Sea of Thieves hasn't advanced to a stage yet where there's enough civilization there for them to become these ports you haven't missed the best bits you've turned up at the right time there's a there's a sense of the past but really the future of sea of thieves that's in the hands of our players that's what we want players to understand that's what we're really excited yeah. about right it's like you said before it's like it's like our players are actually at the beginning of the real golden age and they idea that you know history repeats itself there's yes. kind of a rhyme to it and you know the goal as everyone but probably knows from watching black sails and pirates of the caribbean there's the golden age of piracy was just a short amount of time in real history. And it's this ultimate power play where a group of individuals, a piracy takes hold, and then corporations strive to control it. Companies, the East India Trading Company, want to have, have control there. And we've seeded that the idea of merchants have come to the Sea of Thieves, but they haven't really got any power yet. They're just there giving you these very small objectives. But they're there primarily because they want a piece of that market. Mm. And play that out over a long enough period of time, that golden age comes to the Sea of Thieves, and you can imagine, well, who else is going to come through the shroud? Like, what other ships are going to come through the mist? And how is the Sea of Thieves world going to change? That's what we want pirates to play and enjoy as we continue to build out this world. Mm. Gentlemen. There are references to characters and events in the expanded universe that aren't in-game. Will these feature in the game over time? Will we meet Merrick's son, Derek? <laughs> the handsome lad whose painting sits where Merrick used to. Do you want to take that one, Pete? Oh, sorry, sorry. Do you want to take that one? What, the, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so, in, interesting enough, yeah. Um, I guess with, with the Tales book, Exhibit A, mm. um, We've kind of explored, again, this is, this is kind of like taken from the point of view where we're following um, essentially proxies for players who are going to the Sea of Thieves. They're, they're having these adventures. Um, and, you know, in this case, if anybody's read this, you know, the, this journal is, uh, is, was found at sea, you know, and it's passed from one player to one player, one pirate to another pirate to another pirate. And so they kind of have these journeys, kind of like uh, their own individual journeys as they kind of go through the book. And they keep on kind of like referencing each other and stuff like that. But um, I think, again, it's kind of important that, that, that the stories that are in this book will kind of gradually over time, you know, we, we kind of want to make sure that people understand that the expanded universe and the universe that we have in the game, they are, they are very closely linked. And so, you know, very, very soon you're going to start like hearing some names in the game and, and some of these characters are, are, are going to start kind of trickling in there, especially kind of when the novel comes out as well. You know, some of the, the, the characters in the novel feature prominently in the game already. Uh, and likewise, in the Sea of Thieves book, you know, there's a couple of uh, very prominent characters who, who, will, who will gradually be kind of like, you'll be hearing rumors of them and stuff in the game. And that's as we kind of lay out this kind of narrative arc for the future. So, yeah. And... As, as we kind of move forward with Sea of Thieves, right, and we, we kind of started this with the hungering deep, mm. we will introduce lore, we'll introduce characters, we're going to, because we know people love this, right, you'd, you'd love to have a reason, you'd love to have this kind of crafted quests and stuff, and so as, as we move forward, we want to do more of that, and so with Curse Sales, we're doing it, like there's, there's kind of characters that are introducing this stuff, there's story behind it, there's uh, things you can find out, and, but we'll also take the feedback from our community and players, because a lot of people really like grew attached to Merrick, didn't they, yeah. right? And yeah. so, you know, he came in, he brought the Hungering Deep in, uh, and obviously there was Derek as well, his, his long, <laughs> long lost son. Um, that is, there's now a little painting of them in game, but um, which was just a really cool story from one of our players. But because people love him so much, we're like looking at the future and like, how do we bring, how do we bring Merrick back again for, you know, a different reason yeah. to do a different thing? So, like, we, we know, and we love it as players, right? Like, that, that we... The more craft, the more law, the more mm. story we can give people, uh, that the better it's going to be for everyone. And the Hungering Deep proved that you can bring a like. It was even though it was a quite a short, you know, few hour long kind of um, crafted mission that we that we did with the kind of tools available to us. Like it still played out differently for everybody that played it, even though you were going through the same steps. And it still had what was so special about Sea of Thieves, which is the emergence and the amazing interaction with other players. So we are all in in that kind of route. And so the Curse Sales that's coming up soon will have that. Forsaken Shores will as well, the kind of these time limited campaigns with loads of like lore and story and, and kind of flow. But beyond that as well, we wanna we wanna bring that kind of more crafted quests and things to really enrich our quest system to, to the game in Sea of Thieves. Yeah, I think um, um, if you truly like you absolutely adore Sea of Thieves, like you, you probably are gonna check out the novel and you'd be interested in reading the comic books. But you know, for the average player, they're probably sat back thinking, that's great, but make me care about it in mm. the core game. And 
you know, we're adding a lot of features to the game this year. And the, the discussion amongst the community, which is fair, which is, that's great, but when are the quests going to change? I mean, for us, the quests, we kept them at first deliberately simple because all they were were a reason for you to go out into the world. They're just a motivator to have these awesome stories. It's just a... I'm, I'm going southeast to a particular island to find treasure, but the real story is what happens um, emergently between here and there. It's all the stuff, all those combinations that we spoke about at the start. But in, like, in terms of, you know, we, we like to tease, but the idea of um, making more storyful quests, like quests that have more of a sense of a story and a narrative and a way to bridge the gap between the expanded universe mm. and the game, that's something that we are actively working on at the moment and it that's how we want to expand the quest in sea of thieves not only giving you more variety kind of more roles to play like merchants getting richer the things you do to treasure and getting richer but actually it not just being an objective anymore but it's framed in a sense of lore and a sense of story so when you play them it will feel like an episode of play that has its own sense of narrative mm. and we can continue adding these narrative threads to the game that's what that's something that we're really excited about um, continuing to work on throughout this year and talk more about in the future yeah and and genuinely the fact that you know we, we had an amazing launch in terms of the amount of players that came into sea of thieves and the amount of people that were creating content and stories and everything else and we, so we've got this amazing community and to look at this room you know uh, our sea of friends to steal a, steal a quote from um <laughs> steal a quote from pete but to have so many people here who care this much about sea of thieves and, and out there playing the game on a week, weekly basis a monthly basis whatever um we've We've now got this opportunity as a, as a development team to do what we always dreamed, which was just to keep growing and building and adding more depth and variety and and all, like potential moments for stories and memories and f new friendships and all that kind of stuff. Right? That's and and to do it with our players that are giving us our feedback and telling us what they like and what they don't, whether that's the build adventures and the different ones we put in and how we bring people together or the hungering deep and when we do curse sales, we'll take feedback. It's 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 incredible. Like this is the most exciting time for us and I think Freddie you said it around this is kind of like a social experiment a psychology experiment right where you've got all of these players in this world that you give so much freedom to um, and every time we put something in we learn more about what players like how they behave how to influence different types of behaviors like this is the most rewarding and exciting kind of time of my career and I'm sure that I'm sure the Absolutely. same applies to all of us right it's, um, a, it's a golden age it, it is a, a <laughs> yeah. golden age of piracy and, um, and we're right in the middle of it and so it's like and it's all down to, to all of the people here as well and anyone that's going to watch the video and stuff like everyone that's playing the game is contributing to to making it the, the game that it is and the game that it will be right yeah but yeah you'll start to see as Joe said more of that more of that law playing a part in the campaigns mm -hmm. like building mm -hmm. on what we did with Merrick in the Hungry and Deep um, more kind of opportunities in the expanded universe mm -hmm. that ties seamlessly into the game and then most importantly making that law a core part of what we do in Sea of Thieves for, for players of the game. Uh, just to build on something Joe said as you know it's it's always interesting when you run into someone online it's a normal thing for a certain generation and it's very abnormal for others and in this game, in sort of the players writing the stories, and I told you guys this one, but it was one of the most amazing experiences in morality that I've ever seen. And it didn't come from a book or from a professor. It came from a video game. There was a kid with white sails, completely new, super nice, had gunpowder barrels on his deck. Me and my friend warned him, hey, man, that's not very smart. It's a storm. If you get hit by lightning, that's a wrap. He says, he's a young kid. He's on game. He's like, hey, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> and, and we could have just been horrible to him, right? And so he, and I tell him, I say, hey, you could put him up in the mast in the crow's nest, or if you want to ram people, you'll take damage, but you can put him on the front of your boat and crash. And he's like, hey, thanks a lot. And he goes off, he sails away. So me and my friend, this takes place at Sailor's Bounty, which you guys will know. We went behind Smuggler's Bay after that, spent a few minutes there uh, on a quest and paid some tribute to a fallen pirate, rest in power. And uh, right on, for those who know who that is. Um, and as we're leaving, there's a galleon and it's coming straight for us because their morality is such that they see we have something and they are going to take it. <laughs> uh, they are the alpha personality. So we turn around, we're on a sloop. You guys know to get up wind from the galleon, that's the only way to outrun them. But they're on a line going on the south side, so it's gonna be a race. And as we turn, we see them and they're winning the race. We got over 10 chests and other goodies on board, so we don't wanna lose them, we don't wanna die, but we're in trouble. So I'm sitting here going, okay, are we gonna go around the island again and play this back and forth? When out of nowhere comes the good karma that we gave to this noob. <laughs> My man is rolling straight towards the galleon. 
with a gunpowder barrel on the front of his boat. And my crewmate says, oh my God, Freddy, look left. <laughs> I look left, I see a galleon, I see our little buddy coming in with the white sails and we're both going, yes. He's on the megaphone that we all have now from Hungry and Deep and he goes, I was about to log off. I saw you're in trouble. I'm coming to hell. <laughs> He stands on the back of his boat, crashing into the galleon with his wave emote, <laughs> and then he exits game <laughs> and saved our life. And that's a storyline that you don't get in a regular game, and in this, it happens on the daily. So. Um, and this kind of goes into this. Uh, how do you guys see player actions and adventures forming part of the future development of Sea of Thieves and its lore. You guys have touched on this a little, so we can move forward if you want, but if you want to go deeper, we can. I don't, we've got 15 minutes, so maybe like um, Let's, uh, you guys want to do some Q&A? Do you dare take questions from these scurvy dolls? Indeed, yes. Oh, yes. Sure. Sure. It looks like there's a oh. lot, so yeah. No swords. We'll try, we'll try no blunder as quickly as we can, I think so. <laughs> yeah, keep the questions uh, quick or you will walk the yeah. plane. Yeah, 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 This fine gentleman that was respectful enough to go full cosplay, respect to you. What's your question, brother? Straighten uh, out that mic so we can hear yeah. you. All right, hi, so awesome game. I love the transparency you guys have as devs. Amazing, like wonderful. Um, simple question. I know that my crew all has positions on the galleon. I'm the cannoneer. We've got a captain. We've got someone who's patching and a boarder. What's your guys' positions, if you have them? I'm usually stood at the front playing an instrument, basically. <laughs> uh, like, like, that's, that's, that's literally what I do, yeah. Um, but but my, my position as well is, like, I love to go in and play with strangers, and so whether that's members just of the community, that's like, you know, I tweet out and, and I can play, or I'll just jump in and play, and I just love to learn from playing with other people and to see how they play and to interact and meet strangers, whether that's on your ship or, or, the, or the other ship. That's just kind of, that's my number one motivation because I just find it absolutely fascinating to play with so many people with different kind of goals and motivations and, and you know, wants and desires for the game. It's really interesting to learn that direct from players. No, I'd, I'd, I'd say similar. I think none of us are close to pirate legends, should we say. Mm. Um, yeah, but, but, and the reason for that is when I, when I log on and play, it's very similar to Joe. It's um, just jumping into different galleon crews, sometimes saying you're a dev, deliberately not telling them a dev, and just seeing where people are finding value, seeing what sort of stories they're having, seeing the adventures they're having, because all of that is, is an input to how we build the game. And we, we say it all the time, but it... it you can't overstate it in that we've got this luxury of the game's not just finished and we move on. Like, we've got this live game, this world that's there and players are playing it and we can just nip in as developers and play with people and observe and that then, like, reaffirms to us what the true priorities are, what are the things we should be pushing on, what are the things we should be working on and we've done that. It's still a relatively short space of time since we launched the game but we've, we've adapted our plans and moved things forward and pushed things back based on what real people are doing and that, like, I, just, I just love being that almost like voyeur, that fly on the wall and just watching how people are using our stuff in the game because it is, it is an input to what you do. That's uh, Mr. Wonka right there. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Whereas I just want to be really good with a sniper rifle. I want to be the marksman, the marksman of the team, the one who's there and goes, guys, there's a snake on that beach. Just give me a second. <laughs> now you're Tom Berenger all of a sudden. <laughs> I love it. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I've kind of uh, made it my thing, my quest to become a master uh, rifleman, basically. So, I mean, it's not as deep as your answer's like. But <laughs> Some honest. people like to make things go boom, and there's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Yes. Thanks for your question. Cool. Next yes, up. Man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Captain, what's uh, your question? Hi, I'm Zupod. I'm pirate legend of crew of the disgraced nice. and uh, oh, I love it. on my uh, crew we have this thing that happens that we think that the community needs to know about that is like a super secret it's that on a galleon if you put all your sails going straight into the wind angled perfectly not to port not to starboard you can catch up to a sloop and that is the thing you can do <laughs> and nobody knows this because we believe, we thought that it's because newer players don't know how to deal with like dealing with the wind but if you put your sails directly into the wind, you go faster on a sloop and on a galleon. We call it sails to stupid. <laughs> that's, our, that's our call for it. And uh, 
on our galleon of a couple of legends that we have, we always catch those sloops. Do you think that'll be fixed or is that just a permanent thing in the game? I think we should definitely look into that. I mean, we deliberately <laughs> balanced it so that a sloop into the wind would be faster than a galleon. You haven't caught me yet, you scurvy dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we did this panel. Yeah. <laughs> also, also, thank you for the Black Witch lore and all of that. I love that. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks nice. for your question, Captain. Yeah, awesome. Next stop. Hi, uh, my name's James, uh, and I, it's a kind of like a silly question, how when you break somebody on, like, say, a galleon, you need to have majority vote. Yeah. What I'm wondering is, was there ever a plan to have more people on the sloop because there's a brig on the sloop, but you can't have majority vote when it's just two people? Yeah. We've asked that question before, and it's a very good question. Um, yes, there was, in the sense of when we were, uh, if anyone was in the technical alpha or the beta, um, at the time, um, we stuck with four players on the galleon in the end, but the plan was to try different kind of player numbers, and we tried, we played with that a lot internally. The reason why the brig is there, uh, and it, it may well have a function in the future on, on the sloop, was around, you just got to think about these things around where, in terms of the level design of the sloop, we needed to earmark space for the brig in case we ever needed to add the ability to put players in there based on player feedback or based on flexing player numbers. But it wasn't until we're quite close to Lawrence that we locked down to um, like solo play, uh, duo on the sloop, and then four players. But um, other reasons to use the brig we are kind of considering as well. Cool, thank you. I just want to say that what you guys did for Xbox Addict it was really cool. It was yeah. really, it touched a lot of us. Thanks, man. He, he touched everyone too, right? He, did. he was an amazing he member did. of the whole Absolutely. Xbox community. And yeah, Incredible. rest in peace, dude. Thanks for the question. Please go ahead, brother. Uh, hi, my name is Michael. Um, my question is similar, are based off of the story that Freddie told about the noob. And I know probably everybody's either been a part of a crew or had to do with a crew that just comes in and, you know, pretty much terrorizes the entire server, always yeah. kicking your butt. So I was always <laughs> wondering, um, have you ever thought about or plans at some point to implement like a PvP bounty system where something pops up and then the rest of the server can get together to go after this crew that's kicking everybody's butt? Uh, yes, uh, qu quite a lot actually. A um, uh, lot of kind of thinking around that. We even prototype some stuff around it. The thing that we're all always very careful was with is if you do that, um, even though obviously thematically it seems like it's a bad thing because you've got this notoriety in Sea of Thieves, it's like, that's what you want to be. You, wa <laughs> you want to be someone who everyone wants to kill because you've got this infamous reputation. That's and the hashtag, be more pirate. Be more, well, there you go. It's a pirate world and it's about pirate fantasy and that is a pirate fantasy for some players. So this, this is the magic of the game, right? Which is because it's this um, sandbox, this pirate world, like it is human psychology. It's not just about mechanically it needs to do this. The things you put in there will change player behavior in that shared world. I believe if we were to do that, you'd have, it would be used negatively. It wouldn't be used for the greater good of the server because more people would naturally be coerced towards PVP. And it's not about reducing PVP play, that it's a pirate fantasy world. And I know we joke with Sea of Friends, but it is Sea of Thieves. It's a world where if you want to work together with the crew, hence the alliances that we're working on for, for Curse Sales. That's actually, that's actually a picture of it is, yeah, it um, is. alliances right there. It is. So that, that in the short term is our kind of remedy for it, which is beyond having a cut of the other uh, allied ship's treasure, which you will get, there is that sense of if we make a friend of someone, that, that ship cannot be a danger to us. And it's not an easy alliance, so they can still turn against us. But it's no, you've now got a way to signal your intent to another ship. And that's a way to almost deal with that danger. Because if you take on that little bit of risk and be an allied ship, you know you've got another ship with you. You can sail around together in a fleet and have more earning potential and just protect each other. That's kind of our solution for that. But it's, Sea of Thieves has got an interesting game in that perspective, is that there's not many things that you would say flat out no's to, right? In terms of, just would this thing, would this feature, would this suggestion potentially work in Sea of Thieves? And because it's a game we're going to keep growing, keep evolving and keep experimenting with, there's loads of ways we can take it. Like the Alliance stuff, we're going to put that in and we're going to learn how it works. Like we've tested it, we've play tested it, we've stuck post-its on our heads yeah. and pretended and, and <laughs> like, fun. yeah. And <laughs> But... We're going to put that out there as part of Curse Sales, and we're going to see how it, how it works. And does it does it behave in that way? What does it do in terms of betrayals? Like, and then we'll adjust, and we'll and then we'll look at what comes next. And so it's there's it's really interesting. Like we don't quite know where the future kind of lies on on no. stuff like that. That's about trying to um, balance the different types of player motivations and behaviours within that shared world, right? Yeah. No, the only the only thing I I, I will say yeah. is that. 
we talked at the start of the panel, and I, I am kind of answering your question, sorry for waffling, um, but that focus of making more storyful quests for the players that want to explore and they want to have just that cooperative experience with their crew. And maybe those players are less interested in getting attacked by other players. They don't want that kind of PvP play. The same focus we'll put into making the quest richer and better, we'll put that same focus into PvP as well. It's not about um, pleasing one player at the expense of another. The whole game needs to get richer at the same time. And it may seem that, oh, the devs seem to be really biased. They just want to make everyone friends. It, no, we, we may be prioritizing that now, but it's going to come around to the other ways of play as well. Yeah. All right, thank we've, you. We've got a lot of different, sorry, we've got a lot of different teams looking at a lot of different things. Yes, we have. Haven't we? Yeah. Cool so. stuff. Thank you, Pirate Legend. Next question. Hi, my name's Mike. I just wanted to say thank you for the downloadable code. Now we've seen, yeah, Banjo and Kazooie. We've now seen Joanna Dark as of today. Where's Conker, and are we going to get to fight him, or are we just going to put him up on the wall somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> that's that's not, that one to me, are you? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a difficult one. Pete. I mean, I mean, I mean obviously, obviously, we have the kind of very themey kind of Easter eggs that kind of exist in the world and that are, are very much part of the CBDs world. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun for us to kind of... Um, because we have such a rich heritage, um, you know, a, a lot of people here, we, we are fans, and you'll know... Joanna Dark, and you'll know, you know, Banjo Kazoo, and all that type of thing. And it's, it just seems, it's almost like kind of in, bringing these into the Sea of Thieves in a very Sea of Thieves themed way just feel like, feels like a good way for us to kind of celebrate our heritage. And we know that our fans really appreciate it as well. So, although I won't say right now that yes, Conquer is going at the game or anything like that, you know, it's, it's those types of things is definitely something we like to be quite playful with. And um, yeah, you know, we've got some ideas about what we can do in the future as well, so. Little Perfect. Easter egg though, the, uh, the, the, the Great Mighty Pooh, the voice of yes. the Great Mighty Pooh is in Sea of Thieves. We made sure we got him in there. He's a character on, I think it's Golden Sands. Mm -hmm. He's voiced one of the characters. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got time for one more question. So you are the lucky pirate. Go ahead, hit me. What's up, I'm Michael. I'm a pirate legend. Hey. And um, yeah. my gamer tag is Ship Scuttler. Oh. <laughs> no, that's good. I like I think I know where this is going. <laughs> are you sneaky? Are you hiding on outposts? I, I'm, tr I'm mostly trolling my own teammates. <laughs> Every motivation is welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, before the game came out, there was a description on the game that said that there were 100 players in multiplayer. Was that a placeholder, or are you guys actually planning to do that? Yeah. I, and I know people are going to hate me for saying this. Sea of Thieves... Battle Royale. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Scott, Scott Royale. Royale, come on. Well, well, me. But, uh, so no, so actually, there was really, this is like a really boring story, but I'll, so I'll get it out of the way. But um, you just have to have a dip, when you're uh, pre-release, just in the actual, um, what do you call it, the, the tool where you have to set up your game and you put in, there's a bunch of different uh, things. You just have to put a default number in and it was like zero to 100 is the default thing. And then we, we had it there just in our like alpha and beta stuff. And then we saw, oh no, so that's public to players. We should change that. Um, and so, yeah, there was never any intent to go that high in terms of, um, in terms of players, sadly. But um, it was just, yeah, literally a default setting that we didn't, we didn't change. And we it would be sick to see 30 ships all heading to Golden Sands at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, and a, like, and our engineering team and the team that look after performance would yeah, only be the engineers absolutely would hate you. terrified. Yeah. <laughs> what is the cap right now? Sorry? What is the server cap right uh, now? Currently it's six large ships, but there's a lot of performance work going on at the moment to enable the AI ship stuff as well. So uh, the team back at home, so you can have the AI ships as well as the um, player ships in there. And Curse Sales is going to be very, very uh, exciting in terms, of, uh, in terms of the spectacle, I think, of what the campaign is going to do to drive you and AI ships together. Cool. Thanks, guys. No worries. Thank no, you very thank much. You. Thank you. I was going to just jump in on the Battle Royale question. Yeah, go on. Just quick. <gasps> hold it, hold it. Um, um, <laughs> just, on, just, I think, and it relates to what Freddie was saying about the morality that can play out in this world. I think it sounds quite flippant, actually, but it'd be, it'd be quite easy to do Battle Royale in Sea of Thieves. It would be incredibly easy. And I think that's why it's getting suggested quite a lot by members of our community. I think the responsibility is on us to go further than that. You think, if you think around the, how, the, the type of experiences you can already have in Sea of Thieves, if you were to go to something that was much more session-based, much more competitive, we could, we could push a lot more there with the types of things you could get up to. So I, we understand the question, uh, and there's no plans yet in that area, um, but I think we'd like everything, every mechanic we do in Sea of Thieves, we try and put a fresh spin on it, and we'd want to do, we'd want to do the same if we ever looked at that space.
All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. You guys, this sort of sandbox world, these games don't exist without us. So it's this community that takes care of one another. It's this community that helps these games build. And it's this community that if you see Cheeks Jr. on the three Cs, <laughs> soon to be maybe more, uh, please try to kill me. That's what the game's all about. Um, so if you see me, shoot or be nice, whatever. But I prefer you piratey. So thanks for coming out. Thanks for helping make this game great and give a big round of applause for these three gentlemen right here. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to stay up to date with everything Sea of Thieves, then subscribe to our channel and click that little ship's bell for all those notifications. Cheers. Don't worry, I'll, I'll just wait here. I'm not doing, not doing much anyway. A couple of, couple of good videos there if you want to watch. <laughs>